Whoa, is that really you, Kiryu? Well, we'll be discussing the famous scientist Richard Feynman, so I thought I'd wear something fitting. You can call me Kiryo Feynman. You seem to know a lot about this legendary figure. Could you tell us more about Feynman? Feynman was a key player in the U.S. Manhattan Project in constructing the world's first atomic bombs during World War II. I remember this from Oppenheimer. I've heard that Feynman is also famous for picking locks. Considering how confidential information was during the war, this must have been a very great skill to have. Later on, he became a professor at the California Institute of Technology and retired there. I've read a bit of the widely celebrated Feynman lectures on physics. His humor and wit really shine through in his explanations. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1965. He was a vivid teacher for sure. Now let's see how Feynman introduced the scientific method. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> Then we com. Well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what if this is right. If this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature, or we say compare to experiment or experience. Compare it directly with observation to see if it if it works. <coughs> if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement, is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. It's therefore not unscientific to take a guess, although many people who are not in science think it is. For instance, I had a conversation about flying saucers some years ago with Lehman, because <laughs> I'm scientific. I know all about flying saucers. So I said, I don't think there are flying saucers. So the other, my antagonist said, "Is it impossible that there are flying saucers? Can you prove that it's impossible?" I said, "No, I can't prove it's impossible. It's just very unlikely." That they say, you are very unscientific. If you can't prove it impossible, then why? How can you say it's likely that it's unlikely? Well, that's the way. That is scientific. It is scientific only to say what's more likely and less likely, and not to be proving all the time possible and impossible. To define what I mean, I finally said to him, "Listen." I mean that, from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are the result of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence, <laughs> rather than the unknown <laughs> rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> it's just more likely, that's all, and it's a good guess. And we always try to guess the most likely explanation, keeping in the back of the mind the fact that if it doesn't work. Then we must discuss the other possibilities. There was, for instance, for a while, a phenomenon called superconductivity. There still is the phenomenon,、uh, which is that metals conduct electricity without resistance at low temperatures. And it was not at first obvious that this was a consequence of the known laws with these particles. But it turns out that it has been thought through carefully enough, and it's seen, in fact, to be a consequence of known laws. There are other phenomena, such as extrasensory perception. Which cannot be explained by this known knowledge of physics here, and、uh, it is interesting, however, that that phenomenon has not been well established, and uh, <laughs> that uh, we cannot guarantee that it's there. So, if it could be demonstrated, of course, that would prove that the physics is incomplete, and therefore, it's extremely interesting to physicists whether it's right or wrong. And、uh, many, many experiments exist which show it doesn't work. The same goes for astrological influences. If it were true that the stars could affect the day that it was good to go to the dentist, <laughs> then, as in America, we have that kind of astrology. <laughs> then it would be wrong. The physics theory would be wrong because there's no mechanism by,、uh, understandable in principle from these things that would make it go.、And、that's the reason that there's some skepticism among scientists <laughs> with regard to those ideas. <laughs> Feynman mentioned a lot of great points. Let's break it down. We can think of the scientific method as a good protocol for conducting scientific studies, which is now generally accepted by the scientific community. 
This means the scientific method is not derived from any first principles, and therefore it can actually take up many different forms. There are discussions about different scientific methods in literature. That's right, but in this course, let's stick to one for consistency. Despite these potential variations, the scientific method has been regarded as such a good procedure that adopting it has become the basic defining characteristic of being science. From this point of view, whether a subject is science or not depends on whether the scientific method has been used. Then it makes sense to talk about social sciences, political sciences, management science, etc. Even though these subjects have a weaker focus on the physical world. Exactly.